Well, good. Good, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Uh, good morning. I just want to thank uh, Ramon and Christoph and Olivia for a great panel. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like now to present uh, Nicolas Gabriche from Osborne and Clark, the law firm, and he's going to give a presentation on venture capital. So please welcome Nicolas. Thank you, Janet, and uh, good morning to everybody. I hope you had all had a good night and did some party last night. Yes, this event is called Campus Party, so I expect you not to learn and uh, block and program and whatever you do all day, but also do a little bit partying in Berlin, which is a good place to do so. My name is uh, Nicholas uh, Gabrisch. Just call me by first name, please, uh, Nicholas. Um, I'm a partner, corporate partner at the law firm Osborne Clark. We're um, a pan-European law firm with offices in Germany and Cologne and Berlin and Munich, in uh, Spain and Barcelona and Madrid, uh, in London, in Reading, Bristol and Italy. And uh, I focus on venture capital uh, transactions representing uh, VC funds and uh, emerging companies and we are very focused on let's say the wide uh, uh, word of new media which is uh, e-commerce internet online and all that stuff and uh, gaming um, issues and things like that so I do about let's say 60% acting for emerging companies um, there are a couple of, of companies you might have heard of um, which is uh, SoundCloud or VUGA or uh, we act for Facebook in Germany <coughs> and for a couple of e-commerce uh, companies and we act for funds, uh, um, US funds, uh, British funds and uh, German funds to do invest in young companies at uh, any kind of uh, the stages. Like for example, we have uh, done the SoundCloud um, funding of Kleiner Perkins. We have sold Daily Deal to Google last year. So. Uh, a broad range of uh, things uh, we advise on. What we don't do is uh, give capital. We give uh, know-how and help um, to structure your funding, your transaction from the start, from your seed round um, to hopefully a big exit to a big player. What I want to tell you today <clears throat> in the next, uh, let's say, 45 minutes is what you expect uh, from VCs on terms. So how do they um, approach you uh, legally wise, what are um, things you need to look after, what are terms they are looking for, what is maybe market standard, at least in Germany, but more or less all over the world for VC fundings. Please go ahead, interrupt me at any time. I don't want to end after 35 minutes and then there are no questions, so please uh, just go ahead and ask whatever you you uh, want to want to ask. I assume everybody knows what venture capital um, is. Is anybody here who has already a funding, angel funding or a VC funding? Nobody. So, okay, you're all fresh and happy to learn um, what there is to expect. Maybe some general words up front what um, an angel or VC funding is about. The Venture capital and business angel funding is a risk capital. So the angels and the VCs do invest in your company at very early stages when nobody really knows how you develop your idea, your product, to whom you're gonna sell it, who will be your customers and things like that. They're all investing on expectations in, in you, your product and your team and your company. And what the VC wants to do is develop the company with you together for a range, let's say, three, five, six years and then sell it. And that's a very important uh, thing you need to know is um, that VC is an exit-driven financing model. So if you are looking for someone who's financing your company until you're 65 and then you retire, um, then the VC is the wrong person. He wants to sell the company um, let's say more sooner than uh, later to make the biggest profit out of it. And one of the things you will always find in um, VC contracts is that profits, if there are any at a later stage of, of the development of your company, are not distributed to the shareholders but reinvested in the company. That's because they want to grow the company, grow the model and then sell it um, at a good price. So that's, let's say, <coughs> on a general introduction what um, 
um, what you need to to uh, always keep in mind and always keep in mind when we talk about um, clauses the VC is looking for it it's always exit driven so the exit the sale is something he needs to protect quite intensely just a few bullet points on how this um, how you approach a VC there is a strategy at the beginning of your um, phase for uh, when you're looking for, for money. Yeah? The, the biggest mistake you can do is write a, a, a short business plan, an executive summary, and then go to a website and Google business angels in Germany and spread it all over the net. <clears throat> you will never get a funding this way. You need to be very thoroughly review what um, you're, what you're looking for, what kind of funding you're looking for, who is the right investor you're looking at, how can I approach him, do I do this in a cold call um, via email or can I go to Campus Party or to TOA or to any other events where you meet the people and can uh, speak to them. The, the very famous, you all have heard of it, elevator pitch is uh, as important, um, uh, it's very much uh, important to to be able to address the people correctly. What will happen if you have made contact to, to a VC and he's interested in your uh, in your business? He will invite you um, after you've met him at, at campus party or wherever to speak about what you do. You'll do a management talk. You will need to present the team, present your idea, and um, afterwards he will go into negotiations of a term sheet with you to fix terms, to get exclusivity, to look at your company, at your business model for a certain period of time, to uh, fix already the general terms, what's the valuation, what's the money he's going to invest, what's the share he wants to take, how is he going to invest, is he doing milestones, etc. And uh, if you have signed the term sheet, you're going to a due diligence procedure. So sending a couple of people, technicians, market people, lawyers, tax advisors, accountants, whoever, to evaluate what is there actually, are the rights with your company, and so on and so. And then you'll come to the, to the negotiations of the real investment and shareholder agreements, at which we will take a closer look. Documentation, I've said a little about uh, it already, just to, to give you a feeling what there is. A standard VC documentation, even though for 500k funding round, is today something between 60 and 100 pages of documentation. You have investment agreements, shareholder agreement, you have new articles of your company, you have uh, management service agreements for, for the management, you have bylaws for management, you have bylaws for an advisory board, you have warranty catalogs, you might have uh, incentive programs, virtual share option programs and whatsoever. So there's a lot of stuff uh, on documentation and with disclosures against warranties um, you are very very easy in a small round uh, up to 200 pages of documentation which needs to be notarized in Germany um, so that's quite a hassle but uh, a lot of uh, guys before uh, you have managed um, to do so. Just a few words on <clears throat> on the term sheets. I just pick some some points which are important for you to know. When you get a term sheet from a from an investor, there's always a big heading which says non-binding term sheet. And then a lot of people think, okay, it's non-binding, whatever. I uh, sounds fine. Don't need to involve anybody. I'll sign it, and then we see what's happening. And this is a big mistake because there is always a non-binding and a binding part of the term sheet. The non-binding part will deal with the terms of the investment. Okay, fine, it's non-binding. But the binding part will deal with exclusivity, with confidentiality, with breakup fees. Uh, what happens if I sign the term sheet and run away during exclusivity and sign with another VC? Then there's a breakup fee. 20, 30,000, 40,000 euros, which you'll need to pay to the VC whose term sheet you have broken. Exclusivity, uh, as I said, confidentiality is a big issue. There's a, a break or a penalty payment if you breach confidentiality um, during negotiations with the VC. So that's on the binding part. But on the non-binding part, it's also important to think a little bit longer than just reading the words it's on non-binding about um, what's written there because the, the VC will put in his general view of the terms let's say the valuation of two million pre-money 
uh, the investment of 500,000 euros, the shares he wants to take, the certain rights he wants to get. And when you sign this and you come to negotiation of the agreements, and uh, then you say, okay, I signed this, but it was all non-binding. Now we talk about a three million valuation, and there's no real reason for you because of the development of the company. In the meantime, you've signed a big customer contract or whatsoever. Um, then you're breaking those terms, and there's a legal institution in, in, in Germany, which we call culpa in contrahendo, where you um, breach someone's expectation into signing a contract, you know, because you have told the VC, I'm fine in January with two million valuation, but now I want three without any reason, then the VC can step away and say, okay, you broke this in a pre-signing uh, stage, and he can claim for damages. And damages would, in this situation, generally be, for example, advisor fees. Yeah, he's already sent a couple of tax advisors to evaluate, has spent 5,000 euros. This is a typical damage claim he would raise. So what we always recommend, take a little bit of time to read the term sheet, which is 5 to 15 pages uh, the most, and uh, think about it thoroughly and get someone to help you. And what we do, and a lot of others do this is, uh, um, also, uh, take a look for a lump sum payment um, of a few hundred euros to read through a term sheet. We do about 60, 70 angel and VC fundings every year. So we have seen a lot of term sheets and we can, within one hour, we can tell you, or two hours, we can tell you where are the, the things you need to negotiate. So just please keep this in mind. Don't sign anything which says non-binding uh, without having thought about it um, more thoroughly. How does the, the VC or the investor, let's call him investor, um, invest into your company. There are a couple um, variations you can choose, a direct investment, a loan, convertible loan, a silent partnership, a virtual share, whatsoever. The absolute most common uh, in Germany and as far as I uh, um, know in Europe and the US as well is a direct investment. So he takes a real share, he becomes a shareholder in the company pays a subscription fee, which is the share, the, the nominal share price. In German, it's a, the Stammkapital, so the, the value of the share, um, uh, the statutory value. And then he pays uh, um, an additional payment into the capital reserve, which is the actual investment. For example, he signs a share of 1,000 euros, and he wants to invest 500,000. He would pay 1,000 as subscription price for the actual share, 499,000 uh, into capital reserve for the company to spend. That's the, the, the most classical investment and, and um, almost all of the VCs do it because they want to sit on your shareholder table. They want to be a real part of the business and not stand outside of the company. They want to control, they want to take a look at the company, they want to be involved. Um, forms of financings you also see um, are convertible loans where the VC may be combined to a direct investment or at a later stage, as a bridge funding, for example, grants a convertible loan, let's say 500,000 euros, with the right to convert this loan into real shares, either at a already agreed upon valuation, at a valuation of a future financing round with a discount, um, for example, because he invested at an earlier stage, um, or without a discount, adjust to the future valuation or whatsoever. So this is something <clears throat> which we see quite often and we need to think about one, um, one big issue. There's a, in Germany a state fund called the Hightech Gründerfonds, which some of you might have heard of. And the, the standard model of the Hightech Gründerfonds is to take a share of 15% to pay nominal value and to grant the entire investment um, through a convertible loan, which he can convert in further financing rounds at the terms and the valuation of the further financing rounds. And <clears throat> the companies funded by the high tech they are they have to be younger than one year. And when you calculate 500,000 investment, 15%, you end up at a valuation of something 3 million euros. So a lot of people think, wow, that's a good deal. I get. I'm not a half a year old yet, three million valuation, but that's not the case because of the convertible loan. Because the investment can, at further investment rounds, be converted into shares without paying new funding, but just paying nominal value. So he'll get more shares without paying really more money. So the valuation will lower 
in future financing rounds. So the actual valuation, hope this is not too fast, but obviously you get the point, is not three million because you get further shares in the future. So that's the, the, the small bottleneck you need to keep in mind on, on convertible uh, loans. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Let's say the, um, the, the, the high tech fund gets 15% of the company. Let's say for a 25,000 euro company, that's uh, uh, 2,800, whatever, 50 shares, nominal value at, at one euro per share. Yeah? And if you put the, the uh, or calculate the investment of 500,000 in relation to the 15% share he gets, 100% of the company is approximately 3 million euros, round about valuation, okay? But in a future financing round, Heide Grindelwald can, to avoid a dilution of his 15% participation, take further shares, let's say with a, he pays nominal value, but just one euro per share, you know? And so in future, he maybe has 17, 18% uh, at the same valuation. So the valuation of the entire company is actually lowered. So it's not really 3 million euros. When you, you, know, when you, when you would say, okay, in the future, he has 18 or 19%, and you would go back to the beginning, he would have invested 18 or 19% with 500,000 euros. It's not 3 million, it's less. No. Sorry, say that again. How? Thanks. My name is Jan, and I would like to ask you what exactly happened to Eduardo Saverin from the Social Network movie, and how to prevent that. Yes, that's right. Okay, so the, the name didn't spring to my mind. Okay, he's asking the question. Um, this, I think this is the guy who, who claimed against Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he has rights on, on Facebook. Um, well, he got, he got a payment, I don't know which amount, or shares from, from Mark Zuckerberg to keep him silent. Um, we, in, in, at least in Germany, have very rarely seen a phenomenon like this that someone claims he has a right in an idea. An idea here in most other European countries is not protectable. You can protect a trademark or a patent or whatever, but you can't, you can't protect an idea. So you can also steal an idea, actually, uh, without, be, without uh, uh, being uh, uh, penalized for it. And um, that's not really correct. Yeah? So don't steal an idea, but it's uh, to, to keep this here. Um, the, what this guy said is, um, I had an idea, and it's very hard, in fact, to prove that someone had an idea in his mind before he put someone on paper, or put someone in a trademark, or in a patent, or in a co code, in a source code, or in software, or whatsoever. And if um, uh, he cannot prove it, that, that he, there's really something someone else invented, which he stole, like source code, like trademark or whatsoever, then it's over here, it's very hard to, uh, to claim that there's any damage. Okay. 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 Um, sorry, and I misunderstood your question. I thought it was about uh, which uh, phenomenon which we see very, very rarely here is like stealing an idea. But um, as I hear, the case was more um, that he um, uh, thought he's being a shareholder, and he and he died. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think if, if, was he really a shareholder? Did he think he was a shareholder? Well, let's say he got. We, we'll talk about dilution in a in a minute. Um, let's put it. Uh, at, the, at the right point in the, in the documentation, okay? So remember me if I, if I miss it, but I won't because it comes on the slides. So the, the effect of dilution in the, in the future. 
Um, okay, we, we talked about direct participation, convertible loan, silent partnership is something that happens in, in Germany very rarely. Someone gives money, not being a shareholder. Um, Sub-participation, we can skip. Virtual participation, we will talk about when we speak about uh, um, uh, management and employee participation. Okay, just one word on, on uh, I, I said a little bit about how, how the um, investor invests in, in the company. In Germany, he does not buy shares from the shareholders, but we increase the capital of the company, the nominal capital, so we issue new shares. So the investor can always invest the money into the company. I think that's pretty much the same uh, all over um, the world. You can certainly sell always shares to the, to the investor, but then the actual investment will go to the shareholder selling the shares and not to the company, which is at least at an earlier stage um, not preferred by, by the um, investors. Um, connected with the investment is <coughs> at many times um, certain milestones. So the VC to lower his risk wants to structure the investment in let's say two or three milestones and tranche payments. So you need to reach a milestone when you get the next funding. This is very, very common and it's um, something which uh, you don't really need to fear as long as you can reach the milestone, let's say it this way. Um, what you need to obey there is when you talk about the milestones, really try to make them reachable for you and try to make them objective. Sometimes we read in, in agreements a milestone which nobody really understands and the party said no no we know what's meant you know but this won't help you because if there's a dispute in future about reaching the milestone someone like me like a judge or so has to decide if the milestone is reached if he doesn't understand it because it's not objective um, written then uh, uh, you'll have a hard time um, reaching an, an agreement and <clears throat> sometimes even though it, it seems uh, strange but you read milestones which Nobody really, know, we understand, but nobody knows what to actually do. Uh, like say, you have an e-commerce platform and uh, one milestone is to reach sufficient customer base. Uh, everybody knows what is sufficient customer base. I don't know, but you still read it in many, many term sheets. So read your milestones carefully and um, talk through with the, with the investor. Let them be read by someone else who is um, capable of, of understanding. Maybe even get someone from your family. Do you understand what's written there? And if he doesn't, then there, there might be a problem. And there's a phenomenon which we see once in a while is that VCs who are really risk averse, which is strange in, in, in venture capital business, um, that they want to be in a position, even if a milestone is reached, to um, have the chance to step away from the investment by having the chance to take a, a decision, do we want to invest in the business at this stage anymore, even though the milestone is reached, but maybe our prior investment, our initial investment is half a year old, the company has changed, the model has changed, we don't think this will develop as it is. So even though the milestone which we agree upon is reached, we decide not to invest. This is something you need to get out of the contract because your financing will be at the investor's discretion uh, entirely. Next big thing in the investment part of the documentation is guarantees. The investor always wants to get guarantees at least on the core business of your company. Let's say rights of the software you have developed. Have you agreed on uh, intellectual property rights agreements with your freelancers? Have you bought uh, um, code which you developed externally properly? Have, you, have all the rights been assigned to you? Have you valid employment agreements, valid uh, lease agreements? Have your trademarks or your patents been uh, thoroughly registered? He wants a guarantee on this, which um, <coughs> leads, in case of a breach, to a personal claim of damage towards the founder. So even if you have your, invest your uh, participation in your startup in a holding entity, in a limited liability company or something like that, they always want to see the founders personally like guarantors 
giving a guarantee to its investor on the status of the business. You know? And there's, you read very, very often, um, there's, if there's a claim, uh, is there the breach of a, of a warranty, of a guarantee, um, a claim up to the investment amount, which can be one, two, three million, um, can be raised towards uh, the founder. You know? This is just something you need to keep in mind. Um, if you don't have the money, then uh, this might lead to bankruptcy, certainly. Uh, so we always need to take a look, very close look at the guarantees. Are they structured in a way you can really grant the guarantee to the investor? Uh, if you, you have all the rights all over the world, nobody infringes your software, you will probably not be able to grant because you don't know. So we like to qualify those guarantees by best knowledge or by materiality or whatsoever. So we take a look at the guarantees. Are you able to grant those? How can we modify the guarantees? And then we talk about what is actually happening if you still then breach a guarantee um, in the course of, uh, of the investment. You know? And there are various models which you can talk about um, except for payment of uh, real money compensation you can issue shares do a compensatory capital increase to get new shares to the to the investor to compensate any damages there are things how you you can structure and um and avoid that uh, um you'll have to pay a lot of money which you might not even have to uh, to vc or investor okay let's come to the to the to the shareholders agreement which deals with the internal agreements amongst the shareholders and there are a couple of um, things you might not have heard of or you've heard of and really don't know what it is i want to explain it to you so you're aware of what's coming <clears throat> there's something which you call a vesting which is common all over the world as well which says that um, the, the, the investor invests into the company into the product but also into the people and if someone from the core founder team leaves the company within a certain period of time, which is usually two, three or four years, depending on the stage of, of your company, then the VC says, this is something which influences my investment because I wanted you to stay for a certain period to develop what there is. And because you're leaving, I don't want you to, to participate to the full extent in the future development and valuation development of the company towards an exit. So. What we do is we take away shares from the founder who leaves prior to the end of this vesting period of let's say four years, pro rata to the time he stays with the company. Let's say, for example, 148th for every month he leaves prior to the end of the vesting period. So if he leaves after two years, the founder would have returned 50% of his shares. That's very, very common question on the valuation he gets for the shares he needs to return and there we differentiate between a bad lever and a good lever a bad lever is someone who leaves without any reason he just wants to do something else this is bad because the VC wants you to stay for a certain period of time to develop the, the business and the bad lever is someone who's been terminated for cause so he's stolen money from the company or whatsoever the good lever is someone who has been terminated by the company without any reason. Oh, I don't like your nose. Leave. Or um, a someone who terminates because of a caused reason, of an important reason caused by the company, which is very rarely like, like the company is. Uh, uh, um, I, I don't even know a good example like mobbing or something. No very rarely but this is good and bad lever and the good lever usually should get uh, market fair market value of the shares he returns and the bad lever gets more or less book value or nominal value for the shares what's quite common today is that a bad lever always returns 100 percent of his shares because if someone is a bad lever he's a bad lever then there's no reason for him to participate in any future development with any share that's the view of a lot of vcs so he returns everything, and a good lever will always keep a participation on this pro rata schedule developing over time. That's how um, vesting works. Um, 
if there's an, an exit event within the vesting period, let's say after three years in our four-year example, almost all the VCs do accelerate the vesting, so you can participate with your entire share in the exit, even though 25% are still unvested. Yeah, terms I said, it's uh, something between two and, and, and uh, four um, years. Then you can always, um, most times at a later stage, oh sorry, I'm sorry, it's here. Yeah, I got a question on the leaving part. How do you define leaving? Is it uh, also to um, start a new, another company or uh, get into another team? Is any situation um, uh, in which you leave the company do not work operational for the company? The, um, the vesting will always be connected to those, if, if, there, if, there are, if there's a founder who's not involved in the operational development of the company, in the management team or advisory team, he's just holding shares, he might, he might be, uh, let's say, out of a vesting scheme because he's not working for the company. The investor might not really care if he's actually with the company or not. But everybody from the founder team who's in the management, in advisory function, developing the business of the company, if they leave, and do not work for the company anymore for whatever reason, then this is a lever event. And then we qualify on the uh, compensation he gets, why he leaves. No, if, if the investor agrees that you work 50% here and 50% there, then that's fine. You know, you could, that's something you need to then need to negotiate. You know? But let's say if you, if you switch from management function to advisory function or management function to employee function, this, will, this is usually not a lever event. Or if you, if you move from a holding to a subsidiary because you develop now whatever business in Spain and not in Italy anymore, um, then this is not a lever event usually. But as soon as you, you're not able to to uh, work for the company at a level the VC wants to see, this can be 50%, 30%, 100%, then this would be qualified a lever event. Um, a threshold, something we see at a later uh, stage investments, if the founders can argue, well, we have developed the company already for two years, I don't want to have 100% of my shares in a vesting scheme, so I get a threshold of let's say 20%, 25% already vested, which never can be taken away in what, for whatever reason. And what we also um, see is um, uh, so-called cliffs that even in a good lever or a bad lever scenario, whatever, does not matter, in a certain period of time, let's say half a year or a year would be common, if you leave in that period of time, you need to give away all of your shares, no matter if you're good or bad lever or if there's a vesting scheme afterwards. So VCs sometimes want to see that you reach a certain cliff period which you have to spend with the company. Rights of, um, of approvals, I, I, I'll skip because that's not very, very um, uh, interesting. The, the VCs will always get certain approval rights uh, within, with respect to management actions um, and de uh, development of the company. And now we come to dilution. Um, generally what happens in a future capital increase, in a future financing round, current shareholders dilute. That's, I think, everybody uh, clear. What, um, b before we come to your issue, what the VCs um, want to avoid is that they dilute because of a further financing round being structured at a lower valuation than the valuation he invested in. So the VC, a seed investment, invests at a valuation of 2 million euros. The company does not develop very well. We need, you need additional funding. And you find a new investor who says, no, no way, 2 million, 1.5. So the, the VC of your first seed funding says, OK, we all didn't know the correct valuation at the seed stage, 
which is a big issue uh, at any time. And we obviously decided wrong because the company did not develop as we expected. It lowered its value. So I want that we adjust my first round investment to this lower valuation. Because if we would have known that the company would develop not up but down, we would have not agreed on a 2 million valuation six months ago, but maybe on 1.2 million valuation or on 1.5. So he gets the right to subscribe for further shares at nominal value, so without paying a big investment money to keep or to put him in a position as if he would have invested at the lower valuation. So we take a look at the cap table, at the capitalization table of the first round, where it says 2 million valuation, we put in 1.5 and see what is the outcome, what would he have gotten, and we give him the difference of what he has to what he would have gotten if he had invested at the lower valuation. That's anti-dilution protection, very, very, very common. Uh, to protect the VCs from a lower valuation in a future financing round. Always a pure investor right, hardly ever seen for, um, for, for founders uh, or anybody else who does not invest into the company. And to your uh, guys' questions on um, what, how can I protect actually my, my uh, dilution, is um, I, I have always, in, at least in Germany, I have a right to participate in every financing and every capital increase on a pro rata basis, always at the terms of the investment, which I usually can't, maybe, if the valuation is very high. So I have, the, I have a statutory right to subscribe for shares to avoid dilution, but I probably won't be able to pay. So the, a, a legal mechanism to protect me from dilution can only be agreed upon contractually, so I could agree that I keep, or I, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to keep my percentage participation in a company to avoid dilution. But this is something you will never, at least in, in Germany and as far as I know, not in other jurisdictions as well, you'll never get that you get a right without, we say, pay to play, without investing, paying to play a role in the next uh, cable, uh, cable increase, you will not... Uh, get the rights to, to get shares at nominal value to, to avoid um, your dilution. And <clears throat> what, what there is there, there is more, more or less a factual right which you, can, which you could use because the, the uh, investment and shareholder agreement is something which is a contract between the shareholders which you need to sign as a founder or as a shareholder. And you can always say, I don't sign it. Yeah, then a capital increase to issue shares can be undertaken with a 75% majority in Germany, for example. So if you have less than 25, you could be uh, overvoted in a, in, a, in a resolution. But the VC always wants to have his protective rights, which he agrees upon in the shareholder agreement, also be agreed upon by everybody. So everybody should be governed by those rights. Yeah? So you could say, I don't sign this if I don't get certain shares. So you. Um, uh, try to to actually negotiate um, any, any sort of dilution protection to, to grant you shares or to grant you virtual shares to keep your participation somehow in the company. But I, I've nev actually never seen this um, that this really works uh, because the the, dilu the dilution protection you give somebody without investing the company, someone needs to dilute in a further financing route. The investor does not want to dilute. If the founders don't want to dilute, this will just not work. You know, someone needs to dilute. Otherwise, we, we can't issue uh, uh, new shares. You know? And um, certainly there is a, is a, a, a risk and, and uh, um, it, it happens in companies who do not develop very well that uh, th because of a lot of financing rounds at maybe low valuations, uh, founders do dilute below 1%. We have seen this. You know? But this is something which is connected to the development of the company and the development of the business of the company. You know? And the, the, I think the way is always to, to try to negotiate a good valuation. So to keep your, the higher the valuation, the lower the dilution effect, that's, that's clear. But 
a real dilution protection for a founder um, is I've n never really seen this over here. And I don't remember, I don't, maybe I don't know um, how this case with, with Facebook really was. You know, they, what we have over here sometimes that <clears throat> as soon as you sit together with someone and, and uh, write on a code, you are a company in Germany under German company law without any articles, without even um, thinking about being a company. You are a, a, um, a, a personal company, what we call a Gesellschaft Bürgerlichen Rechts, a GbR, the smallest form of a company we have. And uh, you can always argue when this com when when later on, uh, for example, you code with three people um, on a software, you are this form of company, as I said. And now, two of those guys set up a limited liability company and transfer what's been developed in this company and develop it further. Then this guy who's been skipped out, he could try to claim, I have been part of this small GBR and I was kicked out when they transferred what we have developed so far assets to the new entity. So I should actually be part of the new entity. This is something which could work over here uh, on a German law. There are a lot of other big issues connected to it, tax issues. If you do it this way, usually you would transfer, merge this small entity into a limited liability company, so everybody is participating in the limited liability company. But if you want to get someone out of it, this is probably a, a way you could choose close to a criminal act already. I, I don't know if this anyhow answers your, your question, but uh, it's, let's say, dilution protection for founders is, I, I would more or less bet, is something you won't get. With respect to the um, dilution protection of the VC, um, there are two different types how we protect, which we call a full ratchet or weighted average. And this is just a formula of the mechanism how we calculate his dilution effect in the shares he gets. Full ratchet means that we just um, calculate what he would have gotten if he would have invested at the lower valuation and weighted average we um, put the investment amount into a weighted rev average in connection to the valuation. So let's say if the first round is an investment of 2 million euros and the next funding is 500,000 euros, then it might uh, um, not be um, fair to actually issue new shares for the entire big 2 million round on the lower basis because of a small additional funding. So you put this into a weighted average, the 2 million to 500 million. It's quite a complicated formula, but um, very, very uh, common. Right of first refusal, we skip. It's a right of uh, um, or a preemptive right. You can purchase shares if someone sells shares first before it's been uh, so before the shares are sold to a third party. Tag along right is something <coughs> which is not so, which is common in a VC funding, but um, you might not have heard of. Is a right for a VC or for all shareholders. It's quite common today to grant this right actually to all shareholders if. A shareholder wants to sell his shares to a third party. The other shareholders can say, okay, you can do so, but you need to sell our shares as well. So we, ta you, we tag our shares to yours. We issue our tag along right. Please sell our shares to the same terms as well. So it's, it's an exit protection for all shareholders. And in, today, um, as a market standard, not um, a purely VC or investor right. A drag along right is the other way around, and this is a, a, still a pure investor right. Um, the VC, for example, finds a third party for an exit procedure to buy the company, but the third party wants to buy 100% of the shares. So the VC could ask everybody else and oblige everybody else to sell the shares also to this third party at the same terms and conditions as the investor does. 
in the earlier days, this was a very strong right of the VC. So a VC with 10 or 15 percent share could ex exercise such a right and, and force everybody else to sell. Today, it's in, in most of the cases connected either to a um, quote of the of the shareholders uh, meeting. Let's say 70 pa 75 percent of the shareholders, including the investor, decide to sell the shares, then they can force the remaining 25 percent. Or, or you agree upon a certain valuation. Uh, if the VC finds a purchaser for the company of a valuation of, let's say, 10 million, 50 million, then we are fine. You can force us to sell. So there are many ways you can uh, structure such um, such rights. But this is very, very a common um, VC right. And um, one of the last big um, issues is the so-called liquidation preference or today often called exit preference, which um, you need to understand from where it comes from, why we have it uh, still today, is when the VC invests into your company, say 10 million euros, and gets 40% of the shares. And if you would dissolve the company immediately after the investment, what would happen? You split everything there is amongst the shareholders. So 60% of the 10 million go to the founders and 40% of the 10 million go to the, go to the VC. This is something the VC doesn't want uh, and the founder would be happy. So someone invented this liquidation preference. So the VC agrees and the investor agrees with you that from the exit proceeds or liquidation proceeds, first I as the investor get my investment back. And then the remaining proceeds we split amongst the shareholders. So this protects the VC from a bad exit where the exit proceeds are less than his investment because then he don't want to share those. If the, invest, the, the exit proceeds are higher than the, um, uh, the actual investment of the VC, it's a a right um, to, to uh, give him a better profit, actually. So this is something you could negotiate, that the right to get preferred exit preferences in a good exit scenario either has been waived at a certain range of exit, the exit is bigger than 10, 15 million, there is no preference, for example, or that um, you, um, that you can uh, agree on a catch up that after the exit preference is being paid to the investor, in the second level, you can catch up to what the investor has, and then you split pro rata. So at the end of the day, it's all been split pro rata. So there are certain mechanisms on, um, on uh, what you can do to protect the investors, uh, um, the investors' fear to... Uh, um, to, to just be able to, to find a bad exit and not protect its investment um, and, uh, and a good exit where everybody, can, uh, everybody else can participate. Usually today we have just a one-time liquidation or exit preference. Sometimes you see factors like 1.2, 1.3, 1.5 times the investment or you see interests being calculated. So investment plus 8% per annum as a, as a preference right. Veto rights, information rights, not very, very um, interesting. So that's key um, provisions from, from investment agreement. And just uh, one last, few last sentences, and we have maybe a few minutes time for questions. Um, Non-competition clause, non-compete, very, very common um, for the founders, not for the investors. During the time a founder is with a company and over here also um, for a period of, let's say, one or two years after the founders left. So many, many investors want you not to compete with your company even after you have left um, uh, the company. In Germany, there's a, uh, for the management, there is um, a compensation which has to be paid by law, um, which is 50% of the salary during the period of uh, prohibition. And um, um, so you at least get a, get a little compensation for, for the non-compete. And <clears throat> a 
last issue for today is in the employee participation, which is um, in, in uh, Germany uh, today more or less market standard to do virtual phantom share programs, not issue real shares or any options, because we always have tax issues on real shares with the employees, sometimes on the options. We have conversion issues when you convert options shortly before an exit. Um, and the employees have to pay on, 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 on the shares or on the exercise options um, wage tax, even though not getting anything before the exit, which a lot of employees certainly cannot pay if the valuation is quite high. So today we do virtual options where you grant the employees a virtual participation in the company, which, is, which is, does not raise any tax consequences until it's been paid out, which is the exit event then he gets paid his out his virtual participation and then he has money on the bank account and pay, can pay taxes. <coughs> That's it for uh, for now. Um, happy to, to hear and answer any, any of your questions. Just a short and quick run through what there is on, on VC funding terms. I hope you, you learned something and you're aware of a couple issues uh, which you can then address in your funding round, and uh, uh, I think there's one question. Thanks. Um, you said that actually companies starting there where people are working on an idea, whether they code or just just um, work on the concept. So you know these things like start a weekend where people come together over a weekend and work on an idea, and in the end they maybe you know they they're lucky and get sort of the, the winning idea there, and some of them might go away and further work on this and bring it to life, but others may sort of bail out. And so, from what you said, I heard that actually you could later on, as somebody who bailed out um, and the company becomes big, say, okay, listen, I've been working on the concept back then on the startup weekend, and I can now claim my share. Is that right? Or if so, if, how should the, the I, team? I don't, I don't know actually how the startup weekend does it, but uh, you know, three day, three DS, three day startup, um, uh, which um, uh, we advise, and if you prepare this event correctly, then the event ends with a company co uh, incorporated, even as a GBR, as a small company, and those who don't want to participate assign their rights. So we actually need to make sure that at the end of such an event, is, is it a three-year startup or startup weekend or whatsoever, that you exactly avoid this problem. And you do it, and that's how, how we did it for, for three-day startups. You incorpor incorporate the company, and everybody who does not want to participate, assigns his rights on what has been invented over the weekend. So it's up to the people actually who decide to work yeah. further on it to make sure that yeah. they have a contractual agreement at the end where they all leave, leave right. this event. Yeah, but if you agree on nothing, then it's actually possible that someone claims later on, I've been part of this, I've been part of this small company, and now you developed and uh, incorporated the company without me, and uh, I need to, to get a share into it. There's one coming. Yeah, so, um, Nicholas, thank you very much. I didn't keep everything you said. Some, some was familiar, some was new. What I was missing a little bit is, or let's say that way, it wasn't very inviting to go for venture capital. It sounded, there, is, there are a lot of pitfalls. You better get, get, get uh, good attorneys, and uh, you try to be on the safe side. But what I'd be interested in is, do you personally recommend VC as the way to go? Is VC good money or is it bad money or is it expensive money? What, what, what's your personal view? Well, uh, well, my personal view is that um, there, there is business angel and VC money which is, uh, which is very good money and there is some which is bad money. Um, uh, that's always in, in life, I would say, because there are, there are terms the VCs want to see and those terms, some are harassing maybe, you would say, but I, I, at least I wanted to, uh, or I tried to um, tell you that some of those terms are not really something you need to fear. But we can talk, the other day I've talked one day about venture capital terms, so it's, it's just a, a small wrap up and there are a lot of ways how you can structure certain clauses to have a fair solution. There are certain things you need to protect for the investor, which is understandable because they invest a lot of money, but there's certain rights 
um, and protections the founder wants to have. Yeah, you talked about the dilution effect and whatsoever. So. Um, you need to find a fair solution, and if there's a fair solution which is workable, and a lot of German VCs um, have very fair solutions from my point of view, uh, and, and business angels as well, then it's quite good money because you get it at a very early stage of your company, in a, in a stage where you, at least in Germany, don't get bank loans uh, or uh, other fundings. Uh, you need a VC or you need friends and family to fund your company. And a lot of VCs, and that's what I meant at the very beginning, take a close look who you address, have very good knowledge about what you actually do because they have done 60 investments or whatsoever in uh, uh, software companies or in biotech companies or whatsoever. So they have a big network uh, uh, where they can help. They um, have good advice in your board meetings on, on how to develop the company. They have a lot of experience. So there is um, very, very good money, I think, on the market, but we see sometimes um, uh, founders and uh, VCs who just don't get together because the VC has certain uh, thoughts on what rights he wants to get and how he wants to develop the company, and the founders have different rights. And then it's, just, it's like in a marriage, this won't work. And, and uh, so you don't, you don't get married with this guy. Uh, how, how do you see the role of uh, Osborne Clark? Are you, are you the guys who talk about terms and conditions and clauses, or does your service go beyond that? and you can be a strategic advisor? Well, we, what we try to do is, um, well, first of all, we, we do the legal advice and find on either side where we are, find the best terms for the investor or for the founder. You know, we, 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 know both, we know both sides, so we can act on both sides, which is uh, uh, quite, quite good. And the, but we always try to give our experience to also both sides. And if we advise the founder, we try to give our experience on what we know about this angel or VC is looking at um, what we think about the terms and I very often talk with the founders say uh, I think the valuation is from my experience very very low I've seen comparable business models being val uh, valued a lot higher or I think those terms uh, are not a market standard term and not a fair term because so that's what we also uh, and try to do to give our experience um, into into a project what we don't do is um, uh, negotiate on the valuation. This is something like the founders or corporate finance advisors uh, need to do because we, we just can't take uh, that deep, close look into the into the model. Um, but we always try to understand um, the business model. That's why we have a, a focus on um, on uh, as I said on the beginning on more the the IT in in, in general, uh, software games, internet, and we we hardly do any biotech. We hardly do any any clean tech and things like that because we don't have the, the sector knowledge which we think is very uh, important to be a good advisor um, in, a, in a funding round for the company or, or for the investor. Anything else? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, from your point of view, uh, what are the key elements for venture capital in order to invest in another country? I mean, not just in the, in the local market, to invest in a company from another country or something. Uh, the same as in the local market. I'm, but, but I mean, to move to another country. I mean, because... At, so at so a German VC uh, invests in Germany? To invest in Germany and then yeah. the, that the same VC moves to, towards, I don't know, uh, Latin to America do to do one to, to, to do one investment? No, to establish there and move to another country, to another oh, well, region. Well, that, that's or also this, well, the, the I've, I've never seen that the VC actually closes down in Germany and moves to the U.S. Or but no, he has open a, a branch. Yeah, he has a branch in the U.S. to do investments out of a U.S. entity or U.S. branch, and the criteria are the same. You know, he's he's, he's, he's of the view that there's good business opportunities in the U.S., for example, or in wherever have the same um, um, uh, things he's actually looking at. He'll look at the, at the, at the idea, the business model, at the, at the management team. That's, that's actually the same, no matter if it's a US or a German a company. You know? and, if, and the question, or maybe I misunderstood you, but the question if, uh, if the v, DVC off, uh, opens an office in, in Palo Alto, for example, that's a decision they make um, on uh, how they uh, see the strategy of the fund. Do, 
are they going to do one investment in Palo Alto or are they planning to do 15 investments in the next years? Then they would probably have someone over there. But we know a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but quite a few funds, like for example, T Venture, which is the venture fund of Deutsche Telekom, they do investments all over the world without having an office all over the world. So they have US investments, they have, uh, uh, I think, Israel investments, and they don't have an office there, they do it out of Germany. Uh, hi, thanks for inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Boyan, and I wonder, uh, can you compare the German VCs, how they perform compared to the, let's say, US VCs? And I would like to, uh, for instance, if you can leave out the incubators like Rocket Internet and the Team Europe from the analysis. Um, can, well, I would, I don't have a, um, I don't have actual figures in, in, in mind uh, um, right now, but from a gut feeling, I would say that um, US VCs probably perform a little bit better than uh, German VCs, but it's maybe also very hard to compare because the US venture capital scene is very, very big and actually very old. The German VC scene is very small and quite young. You know, they, we, we, actually, the, the, the VC investments who are today um, taking place, this scene started more or less in 2006 or five. You know, we had a gap then after the, the burst of the bubble, and maybe in the end, in the late 90s, we had VC fundings. But in the 80s, there was actually no VC funding in Germany. So it's quite hard maybe to compare, actually. Funding rounds are, of German VCs are a lot smaller than US VCs. So all the big funding rounds we have seen here in Germany, SoundCloud, VUGA, um, they're all done by uh, US um, VCs. You know? And so it's, it's, I think it's very, very hard to compare. We have very good funding over here for, for seed, for A, for B rounds, but bigger C rounds, let's say, up five million and more, by a single VC is almost impossible for a German um, VC. No, so it's, it's very hard actually to compare, you know. Any other questions I can answer? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you as well work for uh, limited partners in terms of uh, actually investing into venture capital yeah. funds as to the general partners and like how many uh, I mean is, is it a main part of your uh, activities and it's, it's not a, we do fund structuring um, also for for VC funds and thereby we act also for for limited partners but um, it's a, a smaller part actually of our of our business so my it's, it's also not my business it's uh, guys from from fund structuring uh, who do those um, uh, um, or work for those kind of clients. I solely work on, on the company or on the angel and VC uh, fund, but not in fund structuring. Maybe uh, one more question as well. Uh, did you notice uh, or did you stumble upon cases when actually VCs in, uh, intentionally wanted to screw up a startup in terms of terms or any other stuff in the term sheet? Not, uh, not over here, no. Um, no, n not at all. And, the, and the, I think the scene is, all, is too small in, in Germany, even though there's quite a lot of money currently in the market for, for as I said, early, earlier stages. Um, but it's too small. And I think we see they are all battling for, for, um, for targets. Uh, in, in the US, they're even battling harder than over here uh, for targets. Um, and uh, if there's someone um, in the market who wants to um, yeah, to do something bad, let's say it this way, to, to the founders or screw up the founders or screw up the business model or whatever. It's been spread through Gundersen, Adventure Village, Deutsche Startups uh, immediately, and VC can probably close down. You know? Thanks. Then, well, thank you very much for listening. It's been uh, great to, to be able to, to tell you a little, little bit about uh, what we do here in, in Germany. 
you'll find my details there. you find me on, on Facebook, LinkedIn. And if you want to contact me if a question, don't hesitate. Uh, before, as we say, the clock starts to run, uh, we let you know. So just feel free to ask questions. I'm very happy to answer also by email if you have uh, something you don't want to address in front of the audience. Thank you very much. Enjoy Campus Party and uh, Berlin.